Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. With projected president-elect Joe Biden's inauguration a little over a month away, the Islamic Republic of Iran is anxiously awaiting the formulation of Biden's cabinet and policy, as well as the correlation of forces in Washington, which could depend on the results of the two Georgia Senate contests. But even if the Republicans keep their Senate majority, they could at most block some of Biden's nominees and initiatives, not impose any on him. So for the time being, Tehran is impatiently awaiting, accumulating low enriched uranium as a signal it could do more if it wanted to, keeping its powder dry so as not to give the presumably outgoing Trump administration a pretext for a major military strike and prepare for a resumption of talks and the lifting of sanctions promised by Biden during his election campaign. To discuss these developments, we're joined from New York City in the United States by Dr. Oli Heinonen, who is the former Deputy Director General at the International Atomic Energy Agency and a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center in Washington, D.C. Welcome. Thank you. Also joining us from Central Israel is Brigadier General in Reserve Yossi Kupelvasse, who is the Project Director on Middle East Developments at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Thank you for joining us as well. Thank you for having me. And I'd like to also welcome uh, our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and uh, immediately dive into today's topic. Give us a broader understanding on the latest developments pertaining to this topic. Well, Iranians, the Iranian population um, has had a very hard time surviving over the last several years because of the sanctions, because of the collapse of the Iranian economy, because of COVID-19. But if you look at the regime as distinct from uh, the misery in the streets, um, it can uh, have a lot of satisfaction, um, given the fact that they have survived four years of the Trump administration, of the maximum pressure campaign, of um, ever-growing uh, uh, sanctions, and they have not uh, given up. Um, they have uh, reached uh, the uh, elections in the United States with more uh, uranium than they would have accumulated under the deal had the uh, American administration not given them the pretext to um, uh, go out of the deal too, at, at least ostensibly. They always signal that they are within the confines, that they have not really broken out. And now they have uh, to wait and see whether what Biden said during the campaign and even after it in uh, a series of uh, interviews is going to be implemented in a return to the um, uh, JCPOA or another form of the JCPOA, now including their so-called malign activities in the uh, area, the ballistic missiles and uh, whatever was left outside of uh, the nuclear file. When they look at um, the names um, that uh, Biden came up with, they can uh, be satisfied because both um, uh, Secretary of State designate Anthony Blinken and Secretary of Defense designate retired uh, General Lloyd Austin were for the JCPOA during the Obama administration. So circumstances might have changed. Uh, it is not uh, uh, back to square one, but nevertheless, uh, they may feel quite happy that they are probably going to be rid of the policy of the last four years. Dr. Lohainonen, to what degree can the International Atomic Energy Agency really observe and provide accurate information about uh, the state of the Iranian nuclear program, considering the fact that the Iranians have blatantly lied already several times. The uh, director general of the international body, uh, Nuclear Watchdog, came out and, and stated that uh, uh, in more diplomatic terms. But at the same time, it seems like the Iranians are also moving ahead with uh, legislation in order to force uh, the government into ratcheting up uh, the the fissile materials uh, the, to enrich more uranium to the level uh, right underneath the capacity of uh, one uh, nuclear uh, payload. How is this all coming into play uh, within the context of the times that we're living in? Is this just a, a maneuver as a first stage of expected negotiations with the presumed Biden administration? 
Uh, thank you. I think that we really need to take a harder look on the IAEA reporting practices to start with. I'm not criticizing the Secretariat. Secretariat does what it is asked to do. But there is a big difference in the quarterly reporting compared to the time which was previous before the JCPOA. Because all these quarterly reports only report those activities which have been specified or limited in the JCPOA or by provisions of the JCPOA. So therefore, we really don't know how far the IAEA has proceeded in the verification of the correctness and completeness of Iran's declarations. It has been doing it since uh, you know, 2016, but uh, there is no one time uh, stock taken what has been resolved, what stays ahead, and how cooperative in reality the Iran has been. We have seen some smoke coming from this nuclear archives that the, perhaps the cooperation of Iran is not that good. And we still have the issues related to contamination, which have been on the table two years. So for me, it's an unbelievably long time to find an answer to a very simple question. Why there was uranium on those samples in Turku Sabah? Why we see uranium uh, fluoride related particles, etc. And is the IAEA really having an access to the other places of concern, which are emerging, emerging not only from the from the nuclear archives, but from the other information, it, what it has picked pick from the open sources. So I think it is also time, particularly for the US administration, to think that part. Is the reporting the way the IAEA board and the international community wants it today? General Cooper, Vassal? Well, I think that uh, the major dilemma now is in the hands of, uh, is uh, in front of uh, President Biden. Uh, because he can force the Iranians to, to uh, respond to the questions of the IEA if he insists on the maximum pressure and he takes the, the path that was taken by the Trump administration. But at the same time, of course, he doesn't want to do that. First of all, because he has a different opinion about how to handle um, international uh, policy. And uh, secondly, he has uh, some people around him, uh, maybe not very close to him, but uh, in the Democratic Party that are really interested in uh, easing the pressure on Iran, uh, the, especially the progressive within the Democratic Party. And uh, thirdly, uh, he wants to uh, so solve the problems of the legacy of uh, Obama and uh, Biden. I mean, the, the, this is the the, I, the JCPOA is the, the main legacy. This was supposed to be the landmark in uh, international relations. And uh, because of that, for him, it's going to be quite difficult to say, OK, but we are not going back to, to this agreement. And, uh, and that's why he keeps saying, as Amir Simon noticed, uh, that uh, he has the intention to go back to the agreement. But there are two problems with that. First of all, we are not where we were in 2016, and uh, the, the agreement doesn't hold. We know that uh, the uh, Iranians already have accumulated a lot of uh, uranium and reached to 4.5%, and they threatened to go to 20%. Uh, and that's enough for, uh, if, if they decide to go for to further enrichment, they will be able to have uh, enough uh, enriched uranium for first uh, quantity of uh, that is needed for the first uh, nuclear device within something that is less than three months. And now they are installing the uh, new centrifuges, the advanced centrifuges in the underground facilities in, uh, in the main enrichment facility in Natanz, and they are activating the Fodou facility. So it's, uh, it's not, we are not in 20, 2016. It's something totally different. It, it has to take that into account. And everybody knows that there were many flaws in the, 20, in the JCPOA. Even Biden knows that he doesn't say that there were no flaws. He says, we need a better agreement. We need a better agreement, meaning this agreement was not a perfect agreement. as It was presented by Biden and Obama at the time as, a, as an agreement that would block all path to nuclear weapons by the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. So he has a big problem here, and the question, the main question he will have to face is what is the sequence that he is going to, uh, to adopt? Uh, what the Iranians want, and that's what Amir was saying, that they are happy, 
what the Iranians want is that the first step is going back to the agreement, lifting the sanctions, and uh, from there on, they will be in a much better situation. They will not be able to be under pressure. And then uh, the, uh, they will go back to the, to the agreement as well, and there will be no uh, negotiations about a future agreement. That's uh, the Iranian position. What Biden wants is somehow to move back into the agreement with a simultaneous trick in which everything happens simultaneously. The United States go back, the Iranians go back, and there are negotiations on a better agreement uh, in which the Iranians know in, in advance that this new agreement is going to be different than the one they, they have now. How you make this magic? Uh, I don't see there is a possibility to, to make this magic uh, with the Iranians right now. And what needs to be done is to, and that's what, by the way, people like Tom Friedman are telling uh, President Biden, take advantage of many others, Brett Stephens today on the New York Times, uh, take your time, take, take more advantage of the, of the pressure that is built under the sanctions. And uh, this is, of course, what Israel and the Arab uh, states are telling uh, Biden. So he has to decide to, to which, to which uh, group is going to lend his ear more and how he's going to handle this matter in a way that uh, takes advantage of the maximum pressure and of the weakness of the Iranian regime. Because, as Amir said, they were dreaming about Biden, and then Biden comes and everything goes back to normality, which means that they are again on the path that leads them to a big arsenal of nuclear weapons in 10 years uh, without any threshold on the way and with uh, hegemony in the region and without any economic difficulties. This is what they have in, in their mind. But mm -hmm. it's not going to be easy to, to implement it for Biden. And uh, he has a very big problem in front of him. And it's not the only problem he has, he has so many others. So uh, that's, in my mind, the, the, the dilemma in which Biden finds himself right now. Um, Mr. Owen. There, there are two points um, uh, which are very salient right now. Biden comes in January 20th. Uh, he has his uh, cabinet and his policies in place a few weeks later. Then he is told by his European allies and by his advisors that come June, there are elections in Iran. We must help the moderates. We cannot uh, put pressure on Iran right now because this is going to strengthen the hardliners. So he will have a tough time deciding whether this is the correct policy. Also, Israel will have to decide whether this time around it wants to have some input into the negotiating position of the Americans and the others should negotiations resume. Because the last time around, Netanyahu refused to have anything to do with the agreement. He was totally and in principle against it. And therefore, Israel could not even sway uh, the uh, negotiating positions of uh, the uh, six uh, partners to Iran um, in the way it wanted to. And there are, there are voices within the Israeli defense establishment. Let me just, let, let me just correct this, uh, since I was a part of it. This is totally untrue. <laughs> the, we were deeply involved in the negotiations. We had our voice heard uh, and ignored. <laughs> that's, that's what happened. Yes, it was, was it was ignored. Yes, but, but uh, General Kupevasa, you were part of the professional or technical echelon. When the, prof when the uh, political echelon led by Netanyahu goes to Congress to undercut President Obama, there was really no... Um, will on his part to uh, take account uh, of what you just mentioned. General Kupel, what's your uh, response? Oh, uh, we were involved in, the, in the, all the negotiations leading, but our advice that was well appreciated by, uh, by the professional uh, the team in the United States were eventually uh, set aside because of all kinds of political uh, considerations, which is totally legitimate. But, uh, but this was the case. Israel, Israel was involved. Israel thought that the United States should uh, insist on all kinds of elements in the, in the deal, including uh, very few, if not no at all, no at all centrifuges working, including dismantling the, the, the centrifuges that are left and not just uh, uh, disassembling them. Uh, including no uh, sunsets, and if, if sunsets are included, uh, they should be much longer, including a lot of issues. And, uh, and uh, the idea was that, okay, you Americans want to have one year guaranteed uh, keeping the, the Iranians away from uh, having a sufficient quantity of uh, 
and nuclear material to uh, have a first uh, explosive device, nuclear device. Here's what we think you should do. And, but uh, even though we, we think that basically that you should have a totally different goal, but if, you, if this is your goal, this is what we think you should do. They listened very carefully and didn't follow our order. And, uh, you know, I just published uh, in, uh, in the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, I just published a paper uh, explaining why, you know, the, the Iranians now, after the loss of uh, Fakhri Zadeh, uh, gave publicity to a, a ceremony held on February 9th, uh, 2016 in which Rouhani gave uh, Fakhri Zadeh a medal, uh, of, uh, yeah. an award, uh, because of his contribution to the JCPOA. And uh, I explained what was Fakhri Zadeh's contribution to the JCPOA, all these issues that Israel insisted on. And the Americans, in the beginning, thought they were the right things to do, were totally abandoned by the American team that negotiated. And uh, this is why Fakhri Zadeh was so... Uh, elated, and so were uh, Hamanai and, uh, and Rouhani. This was the JCPOA. This was the biggest achievement for them. The only thing that was problematic in this uh, achievement was the snapback option. And, uh, and uh, Biden now speaks about the snapback option. He says, there is a, but I w even if I come back, I can still snap it back if it's, the Iranians don't behave themselves. But this is, of course, uh, mis misleading because there is no reason for the Iranians to misbehave. The Iranians can simply wait out. This is what they did in the last four years under Trump. And they can continue to wait out until uh, 2030. And then they will be able to enrich uranium to any level they want, at any quantity they want, with any centrifuges they want, including having a uh, heavy water reactor. And uh, their way to the, to the bomb will be very easy. Not well, to the do question, a bomb, to an though, well, the question, though, and I'd like to ask you, Dr. Heinonen, you were in charge of the Iran file under the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency in 2003 when uh, the Iranians, uh, it became later known that the Iranians were indeed uh, actively pursuing uh, a nuclear or, or uh, a nuclear weapon uh, program, uh, something that they stole later after it was exposed uh, by Western intelligence. Uh, now, uh, to what degree... Uh, are the technicalities impairing the capacity of inspectors to really identify Iranian activities on the ground, considering the fact that the Iranians are very evasive about their nuclear activities, regardless of uh, whether they allow inspectors to get uh, into the facilities or not, they still thwart uh, uh, IAEA inspectors from uh, entering sensitive uh, military installations that may very well be uh, a cover for uh, uh, military dimensions of a nuclear program? Well, IAEA inspectorate cannot shoot its way to the facilities. It has to go there according to certain procedures. But in order to implement those, it needs the backing of the Board of Governors and the international community. And this dragging of information like what we now have seen in the archives and what we saw in 2003, the stories are changing, access delayed, people not available, documents missing, documents are not here, you should not have it anyway. So th this buying of time and the tolerance which the in international community has in this case, I, I don't find it very reasonable because with a longer term, it, in reality, your inspector regime deteriorates and you create precedent after precedent. And a good example is now this uh, centrifuge, two, three more IR2M centrifuge lines there. People are saying, oh, you should not install them, but they are there. And is there now a special board meeting called together? No. Is this a big change? Perhaps not. But look just half a year back. First thing, we will move these centrifuges underground. In order to do that, we need to do all the pay, pay, uh, pipe work, put the feed and withdrawal station infrastructure in place. That was done with the argument that it was vulnerable when it was above the ground. But as a result of that, they are now able to put very quickly this three uh, uh, additional cascades in place and operate them if they so wish. They can add seven other cascades anytime they want with a one or two week interval. So this small dose approach, stepwise decoration of the system is the problem. It was in 2003 in different issues, 
and it's still there. And at the same time, we see some politically minded ambassadors say, oh, we are sustaining the JCPOA. It's all okay. The only thing what is missing is that the, the bad Americans are not back into the deal so that we can implement it. I think that this is time really to take a stock how to deal with this file, put IAEA to report on transparent way, and then the board of governors have to give a real backing to the secretariat and not let Iran to accuse secretariat on some leakage of some reports which some member state has put out or leaked out. Reports which has no substance on it. Three uh, pros, uh, cascade lines of uh, IR2M centrifuges. Yes, it is confidential, but that's not the issue. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Heinonen, I'd like to uh, follow up on this. Uh, you're speaking about additional cascades of advanced centrifuges. In layman's term, to what degree, if they are employed uh, within those underground uh, infrastructures, which I personally don't understand, if there is no access, how can you truly monitor them? To, to what duration are you able to uh, reach a nuclear uh, or the fissile material in order to establish a nuclear payload that would then be integrated into uh, a ballistic missile, which the Iranians just acquired uh, this year? Uh, are we now in a stage where the Iranians can technically acquire a nuclear weapon under the nose of the international community and the various bodies uh, related to monitoring the situation in uh, Iran uh, without... Uh, uh, having any scrutiny at hand and, and just uh, come out and declare that they uh, acquired a first bomb, which uh, would change the entire picture? Well, this is what the Iran is now applying, its so-called hedging approach. So you pile up slowly enriched uranium. In the first phase, you uh, produce this 3.67% uh, enriched uranium. Then you start to produce 45 People f see that this is very far from 90% enriched weapons grade material. But there are certain technicalities here which get forgotten in the debate. Once you have enriched uranium to level of 4.5%, you have done actually 50% of the work which you need to do in terms of enrichment to get the weapons grade material. This is the first fact. So it's quite a few steps up on the ladder, if I may so. Then, the number of centrifuges, you add them little by little, then your capacity grows. You have, they have been manufactured, these new, more advanced centrifuges, will, which will cut breakout times radically. Certainly this three cascades, not very much, but uh, there's a space for 2,000 actually in this cascade unit where these are installed. Once you put those 2,000 IR2Ms, which I think they have, that will take a few months. Then you can cut already this uh, breakout time with uh, these inventories which they now have two, couple of weeks, two, three weeks. Amazing. And then you can use, you certainly don't rush with the first nuclear weapon, but you use this as a leverage, as a threat. You use that capability as your weapon at this stage. And then you proceed slowly building, as General Cooper was said, with the time and pass those limits. And nobody goes back and says, oh, well, one month ago you added, well, very bad, but don't do it. Then another two, three months, some additional centrifuges, more material. So they have taken this escalation path and they want to see who blinks first. Mr. Owen? Uh, we are dealing with Iran. This is our topic. But uh, when um, uh, the next administration looks at the world, Iran is a very important part, but only part of the picture. It has to deal with China, with Russia, with North Korea. And uh, President Trump um, decided that he is going to be the president of America. America first, make America great again. He was not running for the office of leader of the free world as we um, used to know from FDR on American presidents. President-elect uh, Biden probably wants to revert to, to this uh, type. And if he does, he will have to take into account 
NATO, the various countries. You know, we started with Iran with the EU3. Now, Britain is not even part of the EU with Brexit. The world has changed. So Iran will be dealt with as part of the uh, remade American policy, and we will have to see it throughout 2021. General Kuprovasa, we have uh, uh, less than a minute and 20 seconds, but I'd, I'd like to hear from you. To what degree is Israel in a position to say that if Iran reaches the point of being able to acquire a nuclear weapon within two weeks to three weeks tops, uh, it will act and not wait for the American administration to, uh, to put its uh, future in the hands of others? Yeah, put aside the technical capability, of course, it's extremely illogical for Israel to say something like that when the new administration coming in. I mean, the most important thing for Israel is to make sure that uh, the Israel and the United States have the same position, that uh, the United States will also say that uh, it will not tolerate Iran having the capability to produce nuclear weapons. I think Biden is not uh, interested in, in Iranians having nuclear weapons, so it might, might be the most important thing for us right now to do is to convince the Biden administration that they should be firm on this matter and, uh, and not shy even of saying that all options are on the table. That is something very critical uh, in view of uh, everything Dr. Heinonen uh, said. It's extremely important to say that, uh, listen, threats are not uh, uh, coming only from one direction. They can come from the other. And all options are on the table also from the Biden administration. I think Indeed. it's important that Biden will say that in view of everything that Iran is doing with the centrifuges, with the threat to go to 20 percent and so on and so forth. Well, we'll have to revisit this topic in the near future. This is, of course, uh, very alarming and uh, we need to comp uh, continue monitoring this on a media perspective as well. Uh, so I'd like to thank General Kupelvastel, Dr. Heinonen and Mr. Oren for being part of today's panel. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's call to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem. <laughs>